Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. It's available on Pacifica Radio Network, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and more. My guest for this show, Lois Farfel Stark, has been described as a female Joseph Campbell. And I love Joseph Campbell. And uh, I loved uh, her book and her thinking. She's the author of an extraordinarily creative, visionary, and beautiful book, The Telling Images, Shapes of Changing Times, which won four book awards, including Best Nonfiction 2019 from Next Gen Indie Book Awards. She's a former Emmy awarded producer, writer of NBC News documentaries. She's filmed in Liberia, Abu Dhabi, Israel, Omens, Northern Ireland, and Cuba. Other documentaries have covered architecture, medical research, globalization, social issues, and artists. Her website is loisfstark.com. So welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be with you, Rob. Really a pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I call the show the Bottom Up Show, and you, you don't use the word bottom up in your book, but you talk about so many ideas that reflect the kind of thinking that I've had and the conversations I've had over the years about bottom up, uh, you, you use different language, but uh, you're, you're a bottom up thinker and you're a big thinker and a visionary. And it's really a pleasure to have you. Well, as are you, it's quite wonderful when you have that symmetry of mind and are able to expand the conversation uh, in storytelling in current world and in images. Yeah, yeah. So I want to start off by reading a couple of lines that you that I took from your book, mostly from the end of the book. Um, we're starting the interview, but I'm going to throw in some of these. One source of wisdom, one source of wisdom is a wider lens. The future is embedded in the present. To deeply see the present, we need to embrace paradox, hold opposites, and accept complexities with infinite causes and consequences. We were nature-centered, then human-centered, and now we become planet-centered. Being able to recognize past mindsets can alert us to current change, teach us to enlarge our lens, and warn us not to mistake our mental map for full reality. We live within the maps we create. Changing the mental map will change who we are. To think out of the box, we need to see the boxes we've been in. We shape our world and then it shapes us. Now, I, I probably have undercut some of the stuff you were going to say because uh, my next thing is to ask you to say why you wrote this book and what your goals are for this book. Well, the hope is that we will all learn how to enlarge our lens. Uh, we need order, we need a certain kind of familiarity for security, but unless we keep pushing it and uh, going beyond it and then seeing things from above, we will never grow. We will never see as large a, how large the world is for the senses that we've been given to understand and um, the part of the brain that we use is so small that now we have the technology to expand it and see things from above. And as we do that, both at the macro level and the micro level inside our bodies, we also have to learn to expand our mindset. And the more that we can see things at the macro level and break out of our familiarities, the more we can see the universalities and the common patterns in everything, just as the view from space shows us how common the patterns of a river are matching the arteries in our lungs. And what I love about this book is it kind of takes us on an archeological, anthropological uh, survey or, 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 or a tour. But what you've done is what a lot of archaeologists and anthropologists say you can't do. Because what you've done is you've looked at behaviors, you've looked at ways of thinking, and you basically, based on your observations of what, what remained, you've come up with a way of thinking, because that's the idea of your book, basically. The telling image is how do images affect 
who we are and how does who we are affect what images we use as frames for our existence. And I love that line. I'm going to say it one more time. Where did we go? To think out of the box, we need to see the boxes we've been in. And I think that's what the book does. And then it takes us into the future. It takes us into the present and then into the future. And you know, well, well, this is a kind of a book that is at the level of Hero with a Thousand Faces, the, the Joseph Campbell book, which is not an easy read. I th well, yours is an easier read than the Joseph Campbell book, frankly. Uh, but it's 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 a high level book. It's an intellectual book, and it's really smart. But you've got so many illustrations in it. Uh, I'm going to take this book to visit my six year old granddaughter, and I'm going to try to use it to get her to start seeing these different ways of thinking because I think that. This is the kind of thinking that could be taught to kids, really. How to think. What are the different ways of thinking? 30% of our brain is in visual functioning. And since that's the dominant part of our brain, it's so important, especially for children, because the world is coming to them through screens. They're screenagers. And screen unless uh, we input the variety of ways to understand the world, not just that quick uh, override of stimulus, to really have them become the active agents to find the shapes, almost like playing that game through life, just as we play the game through anthropology, forward and backward in time. Well, you talk about how kids of uh, like our generation grew up with a linear way of learning to read. And, and then, but this generation here has a very different way of learning and experiencing. Can you walk through that a little a bit? I, we have grown up with linear lines. We go from letters to words to sentences, and it's all in a horizontal uh, lines on rectilineal paper, but our minds don't work that way. That's just been the delivery system that has been around since the beginning of writing, at least in the West. In the East, it's vertical ideograms. And an ideogram, you build a different kind of thought process around small things. And then the lines are up and down, so you scroll, but there's something in our moment of time, which puts these two together in some ways, because what do we do on a computer screen? We scroll. <laughs> so both of those things are alive in the way that we're getting and using information today. And while you can take that uh, grid of the way that people my age learn to think and read and compare that to a bursting network, which is the mind of children today. They think by hyperlinks and you can go to a multiplicity of points off of your original question. You can deep dive, you can spray, you can find people floating on the ceiling in a, a games. It's a version of reality that is part of their imagination but maybe their imagination also has it as a part of what is possible. And it may be possible in their world, just as the astronauts have no up and down in the space station, they literally float. So it isn't so far fetched that children are learning to release themselves from these constrictions that uh, my generation grew up with. And it isn't fantasy necessarily when you have no gravity, because there are humans uh, in that International Space Station living in this uh, tumbling world. And, you know, it's because, you know, I call the show The Bottom Up Show, and I wrote a book called Bottom Up, and I write about, and I've thought about how, you know, we've shifted from this linear age, you call it the latter age, I think, and uh, to a a, a, a bottom-up one that is non-linear, that is more uh, based on the ideas of systems theory than the, the linear ideas of Newtonian and Cartesian physics. And what you just described is of how kids are experiencing information 
differently than, than the, we, the way we did growing up, just e e emphasize and strengthens the argument that their brains have been conditioned and programmed in different ways. And who knows how they're gonna end up thinking and seeing the world. But uh, I'm pretty sure it's not gonna be in the linear sequential counting numbers measuring way that our generation and many generations before us did. Right, even the use of virtual reality for adults, um, they have programs where you put on the goggles and you can be someone else in the scenario that's going on within the goggles and you can choose your race, you can choose what happens. And when you're in that experience viscerally, emotionally, visually, you get the same sense of be living in someone else's shoes, just as in those goggles, perhaps you can imagine going to the edge of a mountaintop and getting that queasy feeling in your stomach. The queasy feeling is real, even though the mountain edge is not real. But if we can use those imagined realities po positively to use them for the social problems of our time, then what is real and not real isn't so hard a line and can have um, very fluid ways of expanding us. And you make it clear that what is real and not real is based on the frame that we see things through and that the wise thing to do is to not assume that whatever we're seeing is all there is. And I love that because it, it, it makes you think and ask questions. And, and I think that that's such an important necessary thing to do. Absolutely, that's uh, what we were born. Uh, we have, as humans, the longest 20 year stretch of growing up. You think of a little horse foal coming and standing within the first few minutes of life. And then most animals have a very shortened childhood. But culture teaches us as much as our parents, as our experience. And now technology is accelerating that culture. And so the growing period um, will be so different for every generation. And as technology leaps in its, gen its generations, the age uh, and world that each five-year period lives in will be vastly different. So you've broken mm -hmm. down our human evolution, our evolution, our process into a series of steps, the web, the ladder, the network, the helix, and in the future, the torus. So tell us a, li a little about each of them and what they represent and, and, and how we were and are different with each of those. Um, it began, I think, with the question we all ask is, how do we make sense of the world? And the personal application for that uh, overriding question was when I made our specials for NBC News. And you would be dropped into a foreign country and have to figure out something visual to tell the story, what represents the scene you're seeing, the tensions, the conflicts, whatever. And then I was filming a young girls initiation ceremony in the uh, tribal part of uh, the forests of Liberia. And I realized the women were dancing in a circle and they were in a circular settlement and their very houses around this circular settlement were thatched roofed circular shelters. So everything about it, life cycle ceremonies, uh, circular settlements, the shape of the huts, were just screaming to me that they saw the world as this web and, and that they were all using this um, oneness aspect because they felt embedded in nature. And their view of nature was this life, death, rebirth cycle. But the very next day, I filmed in Monrovia, Liberia's capital, and it was a military parade going on. And there I saw these pods of soldiers and they were standing just shoulder to shoulder. So they looked like a 
page of graph paper just going across your screen. And then I noticed that all the generals were in one straight line and they all had medals announcing their place in the hierarchy. And then it struck me that this was a world of lines and hierarchy that had nothing to do with this woven embedded web that I had just been in the last day. So what happened? <laughs> And, and aside from my story, probably a lot of your audience has been at Stonehenge, as I was just as a tourist one day in England. And the next day I went uh, to King's College Chapel, which are these uh, very steep angled, beautiful churches with uh, spires to even accent more, you know, how high can you reach God? Uh, and those two differences, what made that change from going in this embedded a cyclical uh, mindset to this linear measured view of time forward, time progress, not repeating. And it struck me that two things happened that were really big. One was writing, which we talked about a little, and the other was farming. When you could be at one place, for four seasons, your whole order of organization changed. You didn't have to migrate with a small band. You could have enough in one place to get through four seasons with granary. So now that you had more than a hundred or a few hundred in a clan or a tribe, you had 10,000, let's say, you had to create a different kind of organization. And this is the thinking that went from the first town squares to the pyramids and the pyramids appeared in every continent. It's, we naturally think of Egypt uh, as the classic pyramid, but the, all over Central America, there are uh, some are rounded side pyramids, some are stepped pyramids in Asia. In some sacred places, there are multiple period pyramids on sacred grounds. Even in India, there's a steeper angle pyramid. It's praise to different gods, but it still points up. And that's when God went from an idea that the divine was in all things, like in nature and animistic, and then suddenly God was above. And you had uh, to have a priest or a king telling you what God was saying. And then if you take those measurement uh, values, that is our the layout grid of modern cities. And it's the ever higher um, skyscrapers that we build. And I think we've just reached the limit of that to see how little sense it still makes. Now you call that phase the that, ladder phase. Right, I go from web to ladder and um, I, Think of it as then, because I like to think that we've learned a little bit about the systems and climate change and ecology and such that we're entering a new mindset. But I think the next two shapes that we're now at play with are the helix and the network. And if you put a webbed ladder together, literally, it revolves and evolves. And as DNA, the double helix of DNA, in genetics, it can tell the very same story that early man told, life, death, rebirth. But science is our god, not the, the mythology. So it's a parallel story, but we just do it in genes. You know your grandchildren will carry some of your genes, but you don't know what they'll look like. So both pattern and the unpredictable are both at play. And then if you picture that double helix with all the crossbars bursting open, you have a network. And that's what masters our daily lives in social realms, technological realms, financial realms. And that's ever, ever, ever outreach. Uh, it's endless. So you can't stay there, I think, very um, gracefully for long because it doesn't have uh, confinement. And I think people now have that sense of being lost in chaos. 
And the next image that I think is entering that gives a little bit of form to still that infinity of connections is called a torus, but a torus is just the physics name for a donut shape. Okay, now hold that for you to take a, a show ID break now, and then we'll talk about the torus, and then we're gonna get into more details on, on all of these. And I wanna make sure that you tell us about how the San Bushmen have chosen instead of a lion or, a, or an elephant, a praying man's. So we're gonna take a 20 second quiet time now so I can put the bumpers into the show for the radio show. My guest for the show is Lois Farfel Stark, who has been described as a female Joseph Campbell. She's the author of an extraordinarily creative, visionary, and beautiful book, The Telling Image, Shapes of Changing Times, which won four book awards. She's also a former Emmy awarded producer, writer of NBC News documentaries, and her website is loisfstark.com. So first tell us about the, the Taurus and why you think that's our future. Okay, the the Taurus, if you can imagine a donut shape and picture Apple's headquarters, Apple is a glass cylinder and Steve Jobs thought a lot about form and aesthetics and he brought us uh, a far ways into this technological revolution. So pay attention to that shape and when you're in that shape, there's no right or left. You're forced to see from all sides. And if you can picture it, um, also in London, the intelligence building is built in that shape because they wanted, they realized when they had silo thinking, they got caught by terrorism and they wanted more integrated thought systems. They wanted people to integrate, to mingle, to have multiple contributions to solving certain problems. In China, there are upright ring buildings that are hotels. So imagine living inside a donut that's standing on its side. And as you wander inside this building, every place you go has a different point of view. And it's one way literally to help us see from all sides. It's also in nature because the electromagnetic field around our bodies is a torus and the electromagnetic field around earth is a torus. So all of the particles of our lives, of the world and whatever you call them, uh, cells to the cosmos, if you imagine these things spinning inside of a donut, then you have a feedback loop. And that feedback loop both has the unpredictable because there's new interactions, but it also gives you that overall pattern. So it takes you out of the chaos of the infinity of the network and it brings those, it keeps the connectivity but it gives it a form of rotation that gives you always ever evolving processes. Well, I think my favorite image from the book is the one of the human magnetic field. Uh, and I, I guess one of the reasons I like it is a friend of mine did some, Gary Schwartz did some research looking at how the, the energy from the heart can be detected in another person's brain if they're nearby. So when our magnetic field, our energy field around us projects to other people and to the environment. So we're always connecting with the environment. And this idea of the, the Taurus is, is an idea that, sh that indicates that we're always connected. And, and you know, I, I like to think that where we, we've where we've headed is 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 from linear thinking to systems thinking, and again, you get into the whole chaos thing. That's chaos theory, and so I, I think we're we're talking about the same things. I think, and exactly. So I, I, I'm just curious, how will shifting from 
network and helix to the toroidal way change who we are? Hopefully it will both give us a sense of oneness uh, without the, oneness is not sameness. And I think people fear somehow that they're losing identity um, if they join something larger, but in fact, they're expanding it and it requires the particular, it requires all the um, diversity that nature shows us to have these large balance systems. Nature is always the, the better teacher. And when you take those pictures that we have from space and you see weather systems and you see ocean currents, they're very chaotic in the particular, in the pooling waters and in the swirling hurricanes. But if you look ever larger and expand that frame, then you can see that actually they're giving us balance. And so having the ability to enlarge your lens allows you to both be your very particular self and in doing so make an even larger contribution to this larger whole. I really like the way you talk about there being like opposing forces and balance. Talk about that. I think we've grown up with the idea that we live in dualities. Uh, and it's been so much a part of the way we understand the body, the uh, right side, left side, the way we understand genders, it goes into politics. Uh, and yet that maybe that isn't the best way to see things. Maybe to see how many variety of ways you can uh, tell the same story so that it becomes a larger, more interesting dance of all these particles, but somehow you're playing to the same rhythm, to the same tune, even as you're creating the spontaneous within it. I like the way you describe the, 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 how the Chinese ask you how the Chinese and the Americans can get along in your answer. I was in China and a, a, a Chinese military general asked me, uh, his first question was, what was um, my idea of um, America's dream? And I said, harmony, <laughs> because I also knew that to be a Chinese ideal. And then he said, what was my view of the American Chinese relationship? And my answer was chopsticks, <laughs> that you need two forces in careful balance to be able to pick up that food, to take it to your mouth, to feed yourself, to feed your country, so that opposing forces can also serve the larger good. They're not always conflict, they can also be purpose. And then as another example of different ways about thinking about the same thing, you have your Romeo and Juliet story as well. Among the documentaries, I filmed ninth graders who had all read the Romeo and Juliet story in uh, that early adolescence. And I asked the Hispanic girl what she thought it was all about. And the Hispanic girl said, well, it's about her parents. If Juliet had listened to her parents, she didn't need to die. And then I asked the Asian girl and she said, well, it's about patience. If Juliet had had patience, she didn't need to die. And then I asked the African-American girl and she said, well, it's about passion. Life is short, go for it. So all of them took this same narrative structure but each found within it their own point of view. I wonder if there's a, uh, a toroidal way of looking at Romeo and Juliet. Any thoughts on that? Well, I suppose adolescence is uh, turmoilish and toroidal <laughs> because you actually in that part of growth are saying goodbye to structure 
and catching the next trapeze that comes along. And so there is a piece of um, what you have to release in order to grab the next and to make it your own, not just the inherited, not just the picked up. So um, in that way, I think if you picture a spinning Taurus, uh, it is like a fast view of all of our stages of life <laughs> and how we have to rethink the very things that we believe in each new stage. And the other uh, images, the, the web and the ladder and the helix and the network, they're not as dynamic really as the Taurus. The Taurus is the only one as you described with the mu movement. And I think what that forces you to think about is, is that it's a constantly changing. It's, it, it's, it's, in, it's a process and you have to remember the process, not just the image, not just, it, it's not just a static image. To be dynamic is the law of nature. <laughs> Everything, even what we consider solid objects like a desk probably are full of some atomic system that is in constant uh, motion. The other forms have motion, but they're more confined, like, um, to someone living in the web period, which was 90% of human existence, it was more like, more like 98 or 99%. Right. <laughs> right, being generous. I was, when you see life, death, rebirth, you see it as a repeating circle. So it was movement, but it didn't go anywhere. It just uh, had variations. And I when told you, that I said, I promised that you would describe the San Bushman's reason that they like the praying mantis. It's such a funny thing to think, why would the Bushman who had such close relationship with nature choose this funny little insect as their sacred um, symbol? And then the more I chewed on it, uh, what's particular as we all know to the praying mantis is that at the moment of mating, the female eats the male. So we hear it in a psychological age and we kind of shiver because to us it's a gender story at first because we're familiar with thinking in general, but I uh, thinking of gender in general, <laughs> but to the Bushmen, they were used to seeing the round of nature. So they saw life, death, rebirth and the impregnation all in a single moment of time. And that's a rather inventive uh, all at once notion of this whole shebang that happens in an instant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So tell us more about the, uh, the network and the helix and, 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 and what are some of its, their characteristics and how, how we are living in that. Um, the, the helix, if you also remember the Guggenheim Museum in New York, it came 1959 to 1960. I think it was finished in late 59 and people started really uh, being able to visit more in 1960. If you have seen pictures of it or walked in it, you realize it's a spiral. It has no flat floors, it has no flat walls. So all of your orientation is completely upended, but you still have a notion of order. You can actually better read the evolution of a retrospective of an artist because if it begins at the top and you spiral down, you're actually inside the life of the mind of that artist. But it was such a a dramatic shift in reality to walk through that system. At the same time in those in the 50s, cybernetics was beginning. And cybernetics was about all these connections. And it actually began with the Department of Defense um, initiative. How do you send a message in a time of war? And they worked out these four 
if let's say Washington was bombed, how do you keep communications? And they uh, found these four universities uh, in California and then developed a system where they could communicate. And that was one of the prototypes for the internet itself. And in fact, it's in a museum in Washington where it's a napkin drawing by one of these engineers that first uh, created the doodle. <laughs> But now it's so embedded in our lives for information, for communication, um, what is lost and what is gained. But it's all in this uh, spiral kind of uh, going from this spiral of no right or left into the network splay of an infinity of connections that our mind now thinks in and that the young generation go to for answers and for stimulus and for explication of their own as they build their systems and their networks within it. And the helix? Uh, the helix is that um, pattern and unpredictability of genetics. We, we take the old, we have the pattern, but we also have epigenetics. And what we do with the patterns that we've inherited make the difference. We can have a set of genes, but if uh, you don't trigger them by how you eat or what you breathe or being aware of our um, environmental causes, then you can control those. But it's, it's always that play with the, what is given and then what is acted upon. I've, Rob, I've lost your sound. Oh, I'm oh, sorry about that. I, I, I uh, it's, it's an amazing book. You've done an amazing job with it. Uh, we're going to wrap. So, anything you want to uh, finish up with? Anything you want to final finalize? Well, I'm hoping that people will be able to add to their repertoire of tools to understand the world. Just add shape. You can become a shape seeker in your very house. You probably woke up in a rectangular room and reached for a rectangular device and stepped out into a city laid out as a grid. And we're never aware how much shapes were shaping you. And the choice is there, even in your dining room table, to make it a round table. Why does the UN have a round table? More people, more ideas can contribute at once. So to be a shape seeker, but also even more importantly, to be a shape shifter, to make your choices so that the world can become more like the, what you would want it to be, more harmonious, more inclusive, more dynamic and creative and interesting because there are the voices of everyone. You know, one of the things that you talk about is that we went from being connected to nature, being connected to, to the world as a sp spiritual part of us, rather than it being a resource for us to take from. And I think this, the, the, the new models, they are more not about things. They're not about shapes of things. They're about shapes of our connections and the patterns of our relationships. And I think that that's where you're taking us, really. I mean, this toroidal idea is, is, is energy. Exactly. And, and I think uh, both in the common language of culture now, we're able to use words for invisible fields that we've never been as common and comfortable using. And everyone is aware when there's a field between people, when there is the connection, whether that's emotional or intellectual, social or political. And yet now we can see even in the way that we um, are able to animate certain kinds of vibrations um, and able to animate things that are in our imaginations or literally at the atomic level, at the cellular level. So the things that were either uh, invisible because like the wind and like energy 
or invisible because we didn't have the technology to see them. We can see them in, uh, in that uh, integrated way. There is even something called LIDAR photography where you could take a picture of the Amazon rainforest and you see the entire forest, but with the filters in different colorations, you're able to identify every single species and determine the health and life stage of that tree. So you have both the particular and the universal at once. And I think that's one of the fields that we're looking for here. We have our particular contributions, but we know we're in this ever extending generation of the human species. And we're taking the tools of our time, but we also know how exponential thinking and exponential technology will explode those tools and being able to uh, help create the structures and the fundamental premises that always were and be able to carry them forward to the new that we cannot yet imagine. And what a great way to wrap up. My, thank you so much. My guest for the show has been Lois Farfel Stark, who's the author of an amazing book, The Telling Image, Shapes of Changing Times. Her website is loisfstark.com. Thanks so much for being on the show. A great pleasure to be with you and uh, to have such kindred spirit. You know, you've, you've, you've described how our world and our environment has affected the way we see the world. But with the onset of coronavirus, COVID, we've got a new world. We've got a new world that focuses around Zoom. It, you know, I, I'm working on an article about how real estate is going to change because you drive past a university and it's empty. These huge forums are empty and all these offices that are empty. How do you think that a Zoom world fits in with your model uh, with COVID-19? Uh, the Zoom world gives us face, and I mean exactly that, face to face. It frames mostly from the shoulder up. So you're looking at all of those uh, muscles in the face that gives us smiles and frowns and thought processes and cues to relate. If you were speaking at the, on a stage, you wouldn't have that uh, immediacy of reading what the face is saying. There are more ways like that at a metaphor level. If you think of the word co-vid, vid is that root word to see. And in a certain way now, we are all seeing together. And that's kind of like the early stage of man when we were in this web view and we were all facing something. We're all mortal. We're facing our own mortality, uh, which no one likes to face. But now that it isn't, it's personal, but it's also universal. It's a reset button. And because you're forced to be inside, you're also unplugged in a way that makes you reconsider all your priorities. Now it's been long enough that you think the things that you were missing at the first, maybe they're not even worth re-engaging with. But I think, and you go back and you connect with people that you knew when you went to camp as a nine-year-old. The mind does that loop. And it's very um, human and connective, even in its distancing and its interior. The other thing that I think is the biggest teacher of COVID is that it's exponential thinking. The viral um, scale that multiplies so quickly is teaching us just how fast change can happen because it's happening at a viral level, but the exponential changes were in our society uh, happening uh, at their 
clipped right before. There's joblessness, there's climate change, there's uh, AI, there's all of those things which you knew but you didn't pay attention to. And now you see how real and how necessary it is to pay attention and to do something. So it's stripped bare all our weaknesses. And then as we re-engage personally, education systems, judicial systems, real estate systems, all of them will be rethought and likely they'll be hybrid. They'll be a little more home personal uh, and also social eventually, but the, I think entirely new models will come out. For real estate, it could be three days at work, three days at home. You, you do your communal work when you're in the office and you know, the office will need half the amount of square footage. Um, all of those things are dramatic changes. People, children need social development as well as intellectual development. They might go at a faster clip on Zoom for their own favorite topics, but they'll still need society to invent other forms where they'll have that social interaction. And it may or may not be the schools that deliver them. You know, it makes me think, uh, I've, I've also gotten really into uh, the wisdom of indigenous peoples. And that's web thinking. And, 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 and when you talk about a helix, it, it, it's really a waveform cycling through. And, uh, and one of my kind of theories of life is that, that we, we cycle like that. We cycle with, with, with like sine waves. And the helix is like a three-dimensional version of it. And, and, and I think that what may be the future, and, and you talk about it in your book too, is, is recognizing those boxes that, that humanity has seen the world through and integrating them. And I think that that's kind of part of what you're describing there is, is doing exactly that and maybe pulling from the wisdom and the, the frameworks of the past in order to make a better future. Instead of having a web, it'll be a helical web. Right, we've been like a fish in water, unaware that it's in water. But now that we're in space, we see these uh, broken boundaries. And it was the San Bushmen who would talk to the stars. We're not the first spacemen. <laughs> they had, uh, they would call them, uh, mother Taurus and uh, sister star. So they were very personal parts of the pr most primitive worlds of the sun. And we're just relearning how to make them the friendly parts of our neighborhood as we are this blue dot in their expanse. Well, can you throw in a little more perspective on like indigenous ways of thinking, the web way of thinking, and how it could be brought into the Taurus way of thinking? Um, there, the Dagara tribe in Africa, oh, in yes. their indigenous language, did not have a word for you. This word as simple and basic as the difference between you and me did not exist. But the closest translation for their similar word meant my other self. So you were a version of me. What I did affected you, vice versa. And to learn to think and live with that kind of vibe between us can be expansive. And I, I think this is the, the bottom-up world we're going into too. This is this is the toroidal world we're going into, where we're all connected and we have connection consciousness. I think that connection consciousness is such an important part of taking who humanity is to the next level. We're we're never separate. We're always connected. This Ayn Rand idea of the individual doing something all alone is narcissistic psychopathic insanity and you know it's a nice thing for a 20 year old to read maybe who is in the process of individuation but for an adult 
you, you got to think about how you're connected to everybody else and how you're responsible to everybody else. You, you, you know, I've talked about it and you, you refer to it in your book, you know, the uh, Native American idea of uh, seven generations and thinking about how your decisions will affect the next seven generations. It's, I think, where we need to go. We're all in this together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much. It's been a great, great thanks to really you. Appreciate it.